All right, welcome to part one of our lecture video series from Monday, February 27th, where we recap the periodic trends that were discussed and shown on Friday. So let's start with the first periodic trend that was discussed, which is the idea of atomic radius. Which is really just a stand in for atomic size. So remember, when we talk about atomic radius, we are looking at two competing ideas. We're looking at the amount of shielding versus the positive pull on our valence electrons from the nucleus. In other words, we're looking at the effective nuclear charge that that valence electron feels. And the general idea is that across a row where you're in the same energy level orbitals, an increase in the number of protons in the nucleus results in a contraction of your electrons inward due to that strong electrostatic pull from the nucleus. So it's moving across a row. So across a row, as long as we are in the same energy level or adding electrons to the same energy level, we are looking at a shrinking of our atomic radius because our nuclei are pulling so strongly on those valence electrons. Now contrast this with what happens as you move down a group, because as you move down in groups, you are increasing the energy level of the orbitals in which electrons are occupying. So you kind of get this jawbreaker effect of you're adding from low to high, right, according to Aufbau. So you're starting by filling your innermost or low energy orbitals and working your way out from higher and higher and higher ends. And in doing so, because you're adding electrons to a bunch of orbitals that kind of like, I don't know, let's say blur or obfuscate or dampen the amount of positive charge that your valence electron feels, we say that there's a higher amount of, shield of shielding. So there's a greater number of protons, but also... a greater number of core or non-valence electrons. So we see a large degree of shielding, meaning our effective nuclear charge is not as strong because our valence electrons have a lot of core electrons between themselves and the nucleus that are kind of making that positive pull from the nucleus not perceived to be as strong. So we've got nice large atomic radii moving down a group. So smaller moving across, larger moving down. So if we were to put that together into some kind of like net trend, we would see here that this is increasing atomic radius, where helium would be our smallest, and francium our largest. And it is from this logic of shielding effective nuclear charge and how well that proton positive pull attracts the valence electron in an atom, where that's where all of the other kind of explanations of our other periodic trends come from. So the other periodic trend that you saw was something called ionization energy. Which is the amount of energy that's required to move an electron. We've seen this before when talking about the work function. And remember when we discuss ionization energy, 
it's always the first ionization energy, meaning the amount of energy that's required to remove the first electron, then not just like the second or the third. We would call those the second ionization energies and third ionization energies. And the general idea again is a lower effective nuclear charge means that there's going to be less of a pull on those electrons and we are easier to ionize. Meaning that valence or first valence electron readily removed. Now there are some general exceptions that you have to look out for. Because when we're talking about electrons and their placement in an atom, we're talking about electron configuration. And we know from our discussions of electron configuration that orbitals that are either perfectly full or are half full are orbitals that are particularly stable. So some exceptions to this general trend is we have to look out for stable, half or 100% full, orbitals. So again, if we're following the trend of atomic radius, then if we are looking at what's easier to ionize, that's down here at the largest radius. What's harder to ionize is up here with the smaller radius. So in this direction, this is where we have increasing first ionization energy. If you want to figure out the trends in second ionization energy, you're going to have to look at your electron configuration. So just remember that the removal order from where we remove or electrons from, from what orbitals first when we're talking about creating electron configurations for ions is first the P, the outermost P, then the outermost S, then the outermost D, then the outermost F. Now the cousin of ionization energy, almost its inverse, is electron affinity. So where ionization energy is the energy that is required to remove an electron, the inverse of that, electron affinity, is the amount of energy that is released when an electron is added. So when we're talking about ionization energy, we are always talking about the formation of cations. We're always talking about the removal of electrons. Electron affinity is another way of thinking about ionization energy, except instead of removing electrons, which requires energy, we're asking ourselves how much energy would be released or how much would this atom be stabilized upon the addition of an electron. So how much would an atom be stabilized upon the addition of an extra electron. And again, we've got to look at things like electron configuration because we know that elements that are very, very close to octet or duet are going to be ones that are likely going to want to gain an electron unless it's a metal, then they'll lose them. And we also need to watch out for our half full orbitals. But again, the trend is the same. When we're thinking about what atoms are gonna be most likely to be willing to take in a new electron, it's gonna be the atoms that have a higher effective nuclear charge, meaning atoms whose valence shells can take an electron in that will feel quite strongly the positive pull of the nucleus. So just like we have increasing ionization energy up and to the right, the amount of energy that's required to move an electron or required to remove an electron, the amount of energy that is released upon the addition of an electron also points here. Because something like, let's say, fluorine has a very, very large effective nuclear charge. It's also a very, very small element. So if we were to think about how well this would be receptive to having an electron added to it, remember this is our 
2s2, 2p1, 2, 3, 4, 5 valence configuration. We're only one electron away from octet. So this thing is going to be very amenable or very stabilized by the addition of an electron. Now, something else that you may not have seen in the videos that I posted, but I do want to talk about is this idea of metallic character. Where remember in this class, when we talk about what metals are, yes, they have these common properties of being shiny and ductile and good conductors of electric and thermal energy and things like that. But most typically, chemically, when talking about met metals and metallic character or metals behavior, we're talking about how good they are at becoming cations. So the things that are best at becoming cations are things that have a very, very weak pull on their valence electrons, meaning they're the things that have very, very low ionization energies. So down here, where we have things with small ionization energies, this is where we see elements with the most metallic character. They become cations most readily. Whereas something like chlorine, which again has that NS2, NP5 electron configuration, that is one electron away from achieving octet or achieving a noble gas core stability uh, electron configuration, which is stable. And that makes this thing not a metal, right? If it wants to gain an electron, it's not very good at being a cation because when you gain an electron, you become an anion. And so we would expect to see our non-metals up here with things that are most metal-like down here. Now, the last trend that was discussed with this idea of electronegativity. And a thing to keep in mind about electronegativity is it's kind of similar to this idea of like effective nuclear charge, but it's not something that relates to like what an atom is on its own, right? Electronegativity has context that doesn't exist in a vacuum. So when we're discussing electronegativity, here's what we are always discussing. We are always discussing the degree to which an atom draws electrons that it is sharing across a chemical bond toward itself. So this is not about what an atom does just on its own. It's about how an atom behaves when it's now bound to something else inside a molecular compound. So like the really silly analogy that I like to think about this is the idea of a bed hog. So if we were to imagine me and my spouse cuddling up in bed, I am a notorious bed hog. That means that I take all of the covers in the middle of the night. I tend to roll away with them. And so if our bed was kind of like the electron density that we had to share, and then there was me over here and my spouse over here, and I was the one who was hogging the majority of the electrons or drawing most of those electrons toward myself, leaving very few around my poor spouse, then I would be the more electronegative element. So what is shared between us is shared unequally because I have typically really strong effective nuclear charges that are so strong that they not only hug my own electrons toward myself, but also they pull electrons that I'm allegedly sharing with other elements toward myself as well. And so the trend follows that if you've got a small atomic radius and you also have a large electronegativity, 
Now, if you want to, you're welcome to look this up. Um, there's something called the Pauling scale. Pauling scale. This is a quantification of like the degrees of electronegativity. So you could really figure out which element is more electronegative compared to one another. Um, but I tend to remember them just kind of like by ranking. So the most electronegative is fluorine. followed by oxygen, which is right next to fluorine, followed by nitrogen. These are all in the same row. And then to the next row, followed by chlorine, bromine, iodine, sulfur, in general, I kind of think of chlorine, bromine, iodine as being the same thing because they're all halogens. But these are the ones you got to pay attention to. These are the elements that are going to pop up as being electronegative, meaning they are going to be unequal sharers of electrons when they are wrapped up in sharing their electrons in a chemical bond. It was a very brief overview of our periodic trends. Make sure you're looking out for trends in effective nuclear charge as well as your electron configurations. And just to give us a little practice with this, we're going to do a warm-up video or warm-up problem in our next video, video two.